Hi guys, I am going to cover patient safety and patient education in this lecture. So during Concepts of Care, we learned lots of skills and tasks, and we will actually be delegating a lot of what we have learned and then supervise to ensure that those tasks have been completed. So when is it appropriate to delegate and what should you delegate? Why can't we, as nurses, do all the tasks ourselves? We simply don't have the time. As nurses, our job is revolved around managing our patient's care, and that is time consuming. And we don't have time to manage the care of all of our patients and do all the tasks. So many of the skills will be delegated to either our nursing assistants, maybe our LPNs, or even some of our unlicensed assistive personnel. That way we have time to complete our job. So let's talk about what we can delegate. This list talks about what we can delegate. We may not be able to delegate these every time, so we have to determine if the task can be delegated by asking ourselves some questions. So what are those questions that we need to ask ourselves? Things that we need to consider before delegating a task. The first thing to think about is the predictability of the outcome. So an example is our patient's um, blood pressure. Typically we delegate taking a blood pressure all of the time. So think about times when it would not be appropriate. What if our patient is coding, right? That is not a task we would wanna delegate and the predictability of outcome should come into play. So we may need to do that blood pressure ourselves. Other things that we can think about is what is the potential for harm? So walking with the patient, we can delegate that, right? What if our patient just had surgery or they have severe orthostatic blood pressure? So they may have a higher potential for fall. So if there's a potential for harm, then we need to not delegate that task. What is the complexity of care? So how difficult is the care? If our patient has a stage four pressure ulcer, they're incontinent of stool, so there's stool in our ulcer, that wound needs to be irrigated, it needs to be packed, we need to apply all of these creams, Bathing, which is something we would typically delegate, may be a difficult task for us to delegate in this situation. So just looking at that um, complexity of care. Problem solving and innovation. If the task is complicated, the nurse needs to be there. Critical thinking, problem solving is intentionally taught in nursing school, but that's not taught in nursing assistant school. What's the level of interaction? Making sure the nurse is available for any psychological or psychosocial support um, or even education. We know we cannot delegate education. So based on these considerations, here's what you need to ask yourself. Is this the right circumstance? Is it the right task? Is it the right person to be doing the task? Did I give um, enough information to provide the right direction? And do I have the right supervision? So let's look at this list again, and let's decide which one of these I can delegate and which ones I cannot, and who are we going to delegate these tasks to. If I talk about ongoing assessment, can I delegate an assessment to a nursing, a nursing assistant? No, I can't. Assessments are not in their scope of practice. But could I delegate that to an LPN or an LVN? Yes they can do assessment. And remember, this is an ongoing assessment, which is okay. What they can't do is an admission assessment or a discharge assessment. Those assessments require a higher level of critical thinking, and those are the ones the nurse has to perform. Grooming, who can do grooming? The UAP can definitely do grooming. Vital signs, UAP, LPNs can all do vital signs. More than likely, we're gonna give that to our unlicensed personnel. NG feedings, if this is a routine feeding um, or setting up the pump, 
LPNs can do this. Un unlicensed personnel, that's not in their scope of practice. They can pause the feed to turn the patient and then turn it back on, but they cannot set up the pump, they can't set the tube feeding, they can't start it, and they can't bolus it. Those would all be the responsibility of the nurse. What about patient education? Providing patient education has to be the nurse. The LPN can reinforce education, but they cannot provide the education. Ambulating is a task that can be done by the UAP or LPN. Remembering if it's an unpredictable circumstance though, that needs to be performed by the nurse. Medications, UAP cannot do meds. It's not in their scope of practice. The LPN, LPN can do these except for IVs unless they're certified or nar narcotics. So basic medications can be delegated to our LPNs. Feeding a patient, if the patient is routine, is okay to delegate to the UAP. We just need to remember as nurses, if it's unpredictable, then it needs to be the nurse. Transfer of the nurse's responsibility for a task performed to another nursing staff, whether that be a UAP or an LPN, they, the nurse still has to retain accountability for the outcome. So as nurses, we can delegate those tasks, we can delegate those responsibilities, but ultimately we are still accountable for the outcome. We cannot delegate out accountability. The nurse is ultimately responsible for any delegated tasks. So let's look at safety of the patient within the hospital setting. We will think about developmental stages, we'll look at individual risks um, and risks in that health setting. Um, remembering that safety is going to look different for everyone. So quality and safety education for nurses, why is this important? Um, this is an ongoing process and this is why critical thinking is so important. It may be safe for one person, but not for another. We have to think about our patients, their status, their comorbidity, their families, and take all of that into consideration to determine, is this safe for my patient? Our standards and rules come from our governing bodies. The ANA and Joint Commission help develop those standards to keep our patients safe. We use the nursing process to develop our plan to help promote safety. So future nurses need to have the knowledge, skill, and attitude to promote safety. We are always improving. That is why we, are, why we report our errors so we can make it safe in the future. And you guys have all heard about CUSIN. Um, you've had that in class, so you should be familiar with that. So safety in the healthcare setting, again, why do we care? We want to keep our patients safe because it reduces the injuries. Patients come to the hospital to try to get better, not to get injured or worse. So by keeping them safe, we decrease their length of stay. We can maintain um, improvement in their functional status. It makes the patient have more self-efficacy, making them have a self of well-being. So we need to start with the basics in a safe environment, meet their physical and psychosocial needs. We have to remember that safe needs applies to everywhere in the hospital. The patients don't just stay in their rooms. We need to make sure they are safe in the hallway, they go to the elevator, they go to x-ray, they go to the bathroom, so they have to be safe wherever they go. We also have to remember to keep ourselves safe, to protect ourselves is just as important. A safe environment is one that does not transmit infection. So always risks at the hospital. How can I reduce those risks of spreading any transmission. So thinking about sanitation, decrease in pollution, hand washing, anything to try to keep my patients safe.
So when we think about safety in the nursing process, here are the big ones that we're gonna talk about. The big safety issues with patients in the hospital, the first one is falls. So we know that falls are important and the best thing we can do to prevent falls is to do an assessment of them. So we have a fall risk assessment. It's very much like the Braden scale. Do you guys remember the Braden scale where we did the pressure ulcers? Um, we do fall assessments with every patient to determine the risk. We ask each of these questions on the assessment and see how risky this is for our patient. Anything four or greater is a great fall risk. So you can see the slide there with the fall risk. Again, remember, kind of similar to the Braden scale. Um, we're asking this about everybody so we can get an assessment. So what are some things that we're gonna do if our patient is at great risk of falling? Um, we can use our nursing process, right? We have an assessment. Um, we, used out, we used that tool right, to assess our patient. So then based on the tool, we have to analyze what are the risks for falling. We need to prioritize that fall. My plan is that they're not going to fall on my shift, and then we're going to intervene. So what are we going to do to prevent the fall? And then we're going to evaluate. Did it work? Was my patient safe? And so you can ask yourself all of those questions there as far as putting um, the assessment. Do, is the call light in place? I'm sorry, or the interventions. Is the call light in place? Responding in a timely manner if they hit the call light. Um, providing adequate lighting. Education um, on assistive devices. And you guys can see all of those there. So if we want to prevent falls, these are some of the things that we can do to intervene. So factors that contribute to fall, um, these are some of the same things we're gonna see on our assessment. Um, so are they greater than 65? Do they have histories of falls? Um, do they have impaired vision or balance, altered gait? What is the medication regimen that they are on? Any postural hypotension, um, confusion, disorientation, um, right? All of those things would be high factors that would contribute to a fall that would put them at higher risk. So now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about seizures. Definitely a risk for patients in the hospital. Um, we'll look at seizure precautions as well as patients that are actively seizing. So when you have a patient that is seizing, um, what's the first thing you want to do, right? You probably want to run, but what is the first thing you need to do, right? You need to stay with a patient. Don't leave them, stay with them. And then you really need to pay attention. What is the time? How long was the seizure? After I check the time, I want to watch my patient. Look at their symptoms. Take note of everything that you're seeing, everything that you're hearing. What do their eyes look like? Are there any movements in their arms or their legs? Any abnormal movements in their face? Are they turning blue? Right, two main reasons that we're watching our patient. We're assessing, we're using the nursing process and assessing, and this is how we're gonna help diagnose what type of seizure they're having so they can be treated appropriately. So if your patient starts seizing, make sure you stay with them and make sure you are very mindful of what you see. We also need to make sure that our patient is safe. Hypoxia is a problem during a seizure. The brain is consuming all of the oxygen. So they may have um, some hypersalivation during the seizure. So we may also need to suction them at the bedside. So we need to make sure our patient has a patent airway and that they have the ability to breathe well. Medication administration may be warranted for seizure activity, so be mindful of how those medications will be administered. If you have a patient that is in seizure precautions, your patient should have IV access. And we'll talk in a couple weeks about um, medications and how quickly things are absorbed. IV access is the fastest absorbing. So if your patient has seizure precautions, they need to have access IV.
Again, upon arrival into the room, take a note of the time, any movements that are occurring, remembering that this could be very scary with all of the movements. Never restrain any of the movements, remembering these movements are very unconscious. So if we restrain them, we could cause tearing of ligaments or breaking of bones. Just keep the patient safe in the environment using pillows near their arms or their head. And then we want to explain to the patient what happened, um, provide comfort, provide understanding, and a quiet environment for recovery. We're going to continue to monitor oxygenation and those vital signs. Roll them on their side to help with any aspiration risks if they do have any hypersalivation. And then be very descriptive on what you've seen. Um, what occurred in the event, any, what movements, injuries, duration, aura, postictal state, what did you see and be very descriptive in what you did see. So what does seizure precautions entail? Um, this could mean different things in different hospitals, but for sure, we're, what will stay the same is oxygenation and suctioning, a safe environment, and lots of education. Not only will we be educating our patient, but we'll be doing lots of family education. If they have a seizure, who do they call? What do they do? Um, our patient will be educated. If they have a seizure, what will they do? Um, remembering that we're not gonna put anything in their mouth during the seizure activity. We're not gonna restrain our patient during the seizure activity at all to prevent any broken bones or tearing of ligaments. So let's move into seclusion and restraints. Um, so this is not, those aren't the same things. Seclusion as a general rule is not allowed on a med surge floor. When we use seclusion, it's usually as punishment and that is not appropriate. So for example, let's say you come to work, it's 7 a.m. Um, by 10 a.m. your patient is driving you up the wall and you tell them, they can't leave their room. That is seclusion, that is punishment, because you're, they're driving you crazy, that you shouldn't punish them. Our restraints should be used occasionally, occasionally meaning very few times. Um, restraints do have a higher risk of death, pneumonia, pressure ulcers, and DVTs. Restraints can be very risky, so that is why we only use them if absolutely necessary. You wanna do anything else before restraints. So trying the least restrictive methods first. So for example, if we have an elderly patient that wants to pull out their IV, maybe what we can try least restrictive is to call the family. The family could sit with the patient to help distract them. Maybe we could wrap the IV. Um, maybe we could distract them by having them watch some TV. We may need to get a one-to-one -one, um, constant observation if um, they continue to try to just pick at that IV. So if we've attempted everything, um, nothing's working, they're still trying to get that IV out, that's when we may need to go to a more um, higher up restraint. Um, non-behavioral restraints, and then we have to get an order from our provider. So let the provider know everything that we've tried, all of the least restrictive um, ways that we've attempted, um, and then have them order the more restrictive or more um, aggressive restraint. Um, the order is only good for about 24 hours. Um, if we still need it after 24 hours, we're gonna reassess, and then we'll have to get another order. We do wanna make sure we tell the patient and the family um, what's going on, tell them what again what we've done and why we have to escalate this. Then we're gonna apply that restraint. We're gonna assess our patient at least every two hours um, to make sure they have their basic needs met, right? Every two hours, we're gonna offer the bathroom, we're gonna offer nutrition, we're gonna offer fluids. So making sure that we're releasing those strengths at least every two hours, assessing the area, meeting their needs, and then reapplying those restraints. Just make sure you know your laws and hospital policies. That's really the most vital information for you to know as far as seclusion and restraints. 
So let's talk a little bit about fire safety. Fortunately, hospitals are built well and fires don't spread rapidly. A couple of acronyms to know are RACE and PASS. Um, so these are what we do in the event of a fire. So let's say our patient brings in their hair dryer. Um, there's a small electrical fire in the bathroom. So first um, acronym is RACE. R is to rescue. We're going to get that patient out of the bathroom. A, we're going to activate that alarm and pull the trigger. C, we're going to confine the fire, so shutting the doors. Um, and then E, extinguishing it if possible. Pass is how to use the fire extinguisher. So P, pull the pin. A, aim at the base of the fire. S, squeeze. And then S, sweep. So you can see here, using the pass, pull the pin, aim at, at the base of the fire, squeeze, and sweep. Now we're going to move into home safety. Um, we're going to break it down by age because safety looks different for patients based on their age. When we think about infants and toddlers, um, infants have the highest risk, safety risks, um, so we need to just make sure that we're looking at all of those risks. Aspiration is a big one, so making sure, and we'll talk a lot about this in peds, right? Um, there are lots of their mouth, they're exploring the world with their mouth. So keeping small objects out of reach, um, none in the environment. If they're eating, making sure their bites are in small bites for our toddlers checking our toys for small parts, never feeding anything that's too small. Um, so things like hard candies, peanuts, um, popcorn, right? Those would all be um, choking or aspiration problems. And we never wanna leave our infants by themselves to feed with a bottle. Um, holding with feeding, making sure that we're just being mindful of that aspiration. Suffocation is another consideration. Um, this is big education, especially for our new moms, right? We, all the new moms love all the really cute things. We buy them for the crib, we put padding, we put stuffed animals, all the cute pillows and blankets, right? All of that is a suffocation risk. So what actually can go in the crib is a tight fitted sheet and that's all they get. No pillows, no stuffed animals, no blankets, right? We can snuggle them in um, a onesie um, and that's really all they need. Babies sleep on their back. They don't co-sleep with their parents, hopefully. Um, as they become more mobile, um, that becomes more of an issue. So when we talk about water, pools, toilets, um, anything like that, a small amount of water our infants and toddlers can drown in. So being mindful of water. Poisoning, um, remember, remind the parents how mobile these toddlers can be. They'll get into cabinets, so making sure they're baby-proofing their home. As far as falls, all of our little ones are top-heavy, right? They have these really heavy heads, um, so never leaving them on the changing table, never leaving them in a high location. We also want to make sure our crib setting is at the very lowest that they can have. And then we talk about motor vehicle accidents. Um, all infants and toddlers deserve a car seat um, so that they are strapped in safely. Burns can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, if we microwave bottles, there can be hot spots. So we wanna encourage not microwaving. Um, bathtubs, you need to have a thermometer. They also like to stick their little fingers in the electrical outlets. So making sure there's covers on those electrical outfit, um, outlets. And their skin is also very thin. So having them out in the sun, they will get sunburned quite faster. So lots and lots of safety considerations. So let's move into our school-aged children. Um, again, these are very active kiddos. You can see in the blue box the different, different um, considerations. Um, when we can talk about drowning, um, we need to teach our school-aged kiddos how to swim. Um, as much as we watch them, it's hard to keep an eye on them at all times. Again, car seats um, to booster seats for all of our school age. There's lots of rules with these. Um, making sure that we're just educating our families, showing them really reliable resources and websites so that they can review how to put those car seats in and what car seats they actually need. 
firearms, um, what we can do to educate our parent, um, educate the child, make sure the firearms are locked up, um, that the gun and the ammo are in two different places. Don't put them on a high shelf. Um, don't tell the kiddo not to touch it, right? As soon as you tell somebody not to do something, what do they want to do? They want to do it. Um, as far as sports, making sure they have appropriate equipment. Sex education is going to come around fourth grade. Um, they'll typically get that conversation at school. It, that does not mean that it um, eliminates the parent from having that conversation. So making sure we can give those our resources for the parents to have that conversation as well. So next is our adolescent. This is our risky um, age group. They like to take lots of risks, um, especially with our motor vehicle, right? They start to learn how to drive and they are terrible drivers. Um, what are some distractors with driving? Alcohol, phones, peers, music, lots and lots of distraction. So making sure we're educating about that. We also wanna to talk to them about tobacco and alcohol, and that includes vaping. Um, one time of vaping can cause some lung injuries. We need to talk to our adolescents about this. We also need to talk about body piercings and tattoos, making sure they're going to an approved location that is safe. We can't stop them from getting a lot of these things done, but what we can do is educate them on how to do it safely. Again, we need to talk about gun violence, making sure guns are locked up, ammo's in a different place. Um, at this point, these adolescents may know how to actually use a gun correctly. Um, we also know that the suicide rate is much higher in our adolescent population, so making sure they don't have access to it. Lots and lots of dangers about the internet, social media, um, right? That sends, it collects information. Um, so just making sure they're aware of that. Human trafficking is huge for this age group. We also need to talk about sunburns. Um, skin cancers, melanoma is a very high risk. So making decisions to use sunscreen um, and or tanning beds. So for the adults, this is our young and middle-aged adults, um, stress and lifestyle. We want to have them live the healthiest lifestyle they can so that when they are older, it decreases those health risks. So educating them, teaching them about healthy habits, alcohol, drugs, domestic violence, depression. Who can they talk to if they're having depression? Again, the dangers of social networking, that is still a very high risk for this population. And then our older adults, some of the risks change with this group. Um, this is more preventative than education. So we're looking at that environment to decrease the fall risk. Motor vehicle um, driving, their response time is much slower. So are they safe to drive? Visual changes are occurring. So making sure they're getting their eyes checked regularly. Um, as far as safety in the home, um, are there any risks for fire? Is the water heater set at too high of a temperature? It should be at at least 120 degrees, if not lower. Avoiding throw rugs, that could be tripping hazards. <clears throat> Making sure we're talking to them about the use of medication. Remember, these are older adults. Poisoning is could still happen. Um, well, how does it happen, right? They take their meds at nine o'clock, and then they can't remember, did I take my meds at nine o'clock? And at 10 o'clock, they're like, ah, I'll just take them again, right? Then it becomes an overdose issue. The other thing that we have to really consider is education and prevention of elder abuse. So what is the purpose of patient education? Um, the value of patient education. Why do we need to provide education to patients other than a discharge to send them home? We want to promote healthy lifestyles. We want to prevent illnesses. And sometimes we forget how important it is to prevent future illnesses and not just focus on the disease they have in the moment. Education early, 20s, 30s, and 40s, is an important time to teach about that healthy lifestyle so they can prevent those future diseases. We also want to talk about help with restoration of health returning back to their normal level, and if they have an impairment, helping them cope with that impairment. 
So when we think about teaching and learning, there's definitely differences in the definitions between teaching and learning. Teaching is an interactive process. It's important that when we are teaching our patients about their disease process, we don't just want to stand there and talk. We want to make sure it's a conversation that's being had between you and the patient and they're understanding what is being said. When we think about learning, that is purposeful acquisition of knowledge, that they are intending to learn what they want to learn. They're engaged in the conversation. So then I ask myself, why don't patients ask more questions about their health? And that's a great question to think about. Are they intimidated by their providers or do they just not know what to ask? So we tend to tell people that they have this really scary illness like cancer. And then we say, do you have any questions? And they don't even know at that point what to ask. So there's lots of reasons why patients don't ask questions. What we need to do is get them the information that they need to process and then go back in and ask them about questions. So what is the role of the nurse in teaching and learning? Um, teach information that the patient and the family need to make informed decisions regarding their care. Good informed decisions. This means they need to know the good and the bad, the pros and the cons for their disease processes or whatever might be going on. We also need to determine what the patient already knows. Sometimes patients have a great knowledge of their medication regimen and they may not need much education, but they also may have been taking this med for 10 plus years and have some misconceptions or they don't understand why they are taking it. So just ask the patient, what do you already know? And then you can go from there. We also need to identify, is this the right time? Is the right time to start educating at discharge? Absolutely not. They are ready to go home. They have someone waiting to pick them up. They've been there for days and they just want to leave. So oftentimes it's early in the admission, day one, day two, when they are ready to learn. That's when teaching and learning is at its highest. So I'm not gonna go a lot into joint commission. Um, just understand joint commission, again, we talked about it earlier in this chapter, right? They help um, support and make the rules for the hospital to keep our patients safe. So I'm gonna let you read over this slide. Um, just so be aware that joint commission is out there. You will have at some point one day, the opportunity to meet with them. So teaching as communication, um, we know teaching is a form of communication. You all know the communication process. Um, we talked about it in concepts one. Remember being a good communicator is important. Um, we have to develop that good therapeutic relationship. That's gonna help us teach them about their medication, their disease processes, whatever may be going on. We have to build that rapport so that we can therapeutically build a relationship so they trust the information that we are giving to them. So things to think about from the patient side. Um, what is their motivation to learn? Do they wanna know this information? And if they don't, Maybe we need to look into why. Why don't they want to know this information? Um, address the, their desires. What is important to them? Why is it important to them? We also want to um, assess the ability to learn. Do they have any physical or cognitive disabilities? Making sure that we're aware of those. If they can't hear what you're saying, standing there speaking to them is not going to be beneficial. So make sure you're addressing that. If they have a cognitive issue, such as Alzheimer's or dementia, making sure there's someone else available to hear that information and ensure that the patient has the information they need. And then the last one there is the learning environment. Is this the right situation? Is the patient comfortable? 
is their pain under control, right? Think about a time when you've been under pain and someone starts talking to you. Are you paying any attention? Are you learning anything? You're not, right? All you can focus in on, in on is that pain. Is the temperature of the room comfortable? Do they have an environment where learning and giving, getting information is being allowed? And that concludes this chapter. If you have any questions, um, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.